Welcome to the Modern Medicine Movement Podcast with Dr. Thomas Hemingway. Have you ever looked in the mirror and said to yourself, I thought I'd be healthier, in better shape, feel better both physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, and be further along in my life? If so, come on this journey with my dad as he explores all things health and wellness from a holistic, medical perspective, even as a classically trained physician. He'll share integrative strategies to optimize health and inspire you to join the modern medicine movement. Welcome, 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 everyone, to the Modern Medicine Movement podcast. And a big aloha. Thomas Hemingway here, and I'm just so grateful, super humbled to be here with you today. Just want to give a big shout out again to my son, Isaac. Wow, I just, I love that intro. My wife, Brooke, who's continuing to encourage me just to make this thing happen. And to you guys, a huge mahalo, just big, big thank you. To all of you folks that are listening, taking the time out of your busy lives to improve your own health because this podcast is for you to really to help you achieve optimal health, total and complete health of your mind, your body, your spirit, your emotions, relationships, truly, truly everything health. And I just really wanted to say thank you in the first week of our show here. We've already had well over a thousand downloads in the very first week, which just truly humbles me. And it excites me, and it just lets me know you guys are listening, you're getting value from this, you're getting excited and energized about your health too. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for listening. Keep sharing. I'm on this journey with you, and I just i am excited to continue to add value. And so keep listening, keep the feedback coming. I'm here to serve you. And I promise to share a couple of your comments, and I have several. There's too many for me to share, but I... I really wanted to share just a couple. Just these are really why I do this, and it just touches my heart. Um, one from Kelike, who says, "Thanks for bringing it all together." And after sharing, you know, her her family story of of some interesting experiences with physicians over the years, she says, "I'm so grateful for your knowledge and your desire to help create a space where mind, body, and spirit can be talked about." I think it all needs to work together. Thank you for being willing to be the voice and helping us understand. I love your authenticity and how real you are. Can't wait to continue to listen. Oh my gosh, thank you, Kelike. That's just so awesome. Another one that just says, perfectly timed and so needed by Mama Leonard. She says, I'm so excited about this new podcast as a former pediatric nurse. I'm always on the lookout for good, reliable health information from trusted sources. I'm so glad we have Dr. Thomas Hemingway to learn from. Thank you for taking the time to share your wealth of knowledge, your passion and excitement for healthy living, body, mind, and soul. Oh my gosh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Mama Lerner. Just so grateful for you guys. It's really why I do this. I just love to share and just, I, oh my gosh, I'm humbled. So thank you. Keep listening, keep sharing, reach out for any topics you want to hear about. In fact, today's topic I've had a lot of people ask me about over the last several weeks and questions about this. It's been kind of a popular topic on shows like the Dr. Oz show and other sort of health uh, um, arenas. And uh, it's a subject that I think we've all heard about referred to often as intermittent fasting. Um, I'll refer to it as more of a time restricted eating because you know, sort of this fasting idea scares a lot of people. And, and there's a lot of extremes of it. And I, I'm, I'm not a guy of extremes. I think uh, really everything in moderation is a better philosophy and extremes of anything most often don't turn out well. So I'm not a huge fan of, you know, a lot of these intermittent fasting folks recommend 24, 36 or more hour fasts. And I'm going to go with a more moderate approach, which has actually been studied and proven to be super helpful And um, so we'll talk about that. Let's get into it. But as we approach this, I just want to basically give a little background of us as humans. We tend to be, you know, diurnal creatures. We operate by what's called the circadian rhythm, which is our daily cycle, if you will. If you like to know why it's called that, well, in Latin, you know, the circa means about dia or circadian means a day. So it's about a day. So circadian rhythm is about a day cycle, which is what our bodies operate on, which is super interesting because even if you threw us in a, say, underground bunker 
when we had no stimulation by light or anything to sort of trigger a clock, we would still have roughly a 24 hour clock. And this would slowly adjust over the time. They've done experiments 50 years ago with medical students where they literally did that. They put them in an underground apartment and wanted to see what happened with their circadian rhythm. And, and surprisingly, um, it maintained pretty close to a 24-hour clock, which is so, so interesting. All of us as living things have this, including you know, plants, animals, even the bacteria in our gut, as I alluded to in a previous podcast. It has a circadian rhythm, and there's basically two major cues to our circadian rhythm that affect us, and they're so simple, they're so natural, so easy to understand. Basically, light and food. So two main things that we'll talk about, light and food. And we'll mostly focus on the food part today because I want to do a whole podcast on the whole light issue and, and things like melatonin and where that all plays in. But what's interesting is that people that have disruption of their circadian rhythm, like people like me who work shift work, you know, a lot of people nowadays, it's... 24-hour environment, right? A lot of things have to go down at night. You know, hospitals have to stay open, which is where I work. And so I'm a shift worker. And, and if I didn't do anything proactively, literally shift work is on the list of the WHO as a potential carcinogen. Shift work. <laughs> I saw that and I was like, holy crap, I better pay attention. And, and I can't necessarily make myself not a shift worker, at least not easily, and I don't plan to in the near future, but there are two things that I control a little bit um, which can affect that, which is my exposure to light and my exposure to food. And for the shift work part, the exposure to food is certainly going to be the thing I can most easily tackle because when we disrupt or mess up our circadian rhythm um, by aberrancies to how we stimulate you know, the, the food part and the light part that affect us, these cues, it can basically give us an increased chance of certain illnesses, everything from diabetes, hypertension, kidney disease, GERD, um, heart disease, cancers, depression, anxiety, Lyme's disease, miscarriage, infertility, all these things. There was a list of like 200 things that, that were listed as basically increased risk of these for folks who had circadian rhythm disruptors in their life, which basically has to do with how we manage our exposure to light and how we manage our exposure to food. So today, let's talk primarily about the food part. I think it's plenty to give us um, material for the next 15, 20 minutes. And um, what's interesting about the food is that, you know, if we look back you know, teleologically and, and where we were hundreds and hundreds of years ago before we had, you know, things like electricity and other forms of light. Um, basically, we we're very simple diurnal creatures. You know, we'd get up with the sunlight, go to bed shortly after the sun went down. And this basically um, made it easy for us to comply with these two major cues of light and food, right? Because if we go bed too bad when the sun goes down, then we're not going to be eating late into the night and screwing up our circadian rhythm. But nowadays, oh my gosh, you know, with all of these distractions we have with electricity, with cell phones, the blue light coming off our TV screens, our phones, our tablets, this can really screw us up. And then, you know, if we're up and we're awake, right, if our eyes are open, well, all too often our mouths are open too. <laughs> and so if we're awake, then we're often eating. And if we eat for too many hours of the day, this can be a disruptor as well which is interesting because controlling this through either, if you want to call it intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating, it's actually super simple, super flexible. You can base it on whatever your schedule is. Even if you're a shift worker like myself, you can basically adjust it. It's, it's not hard. And my favorite part, it's free. It's absolutely free. And if you do this, you can improve not only your energy, but your blood pressure tends to improve, your insulin sensitivity Im improves, usually you'll have some weight loss. Um, but more importantly, if you aim for, I, I like to have a goal of at least 14 hours of fasting, um, because this is where a lot of the data has been shown to, to be, is basically a feeding window of 10 hours a day. So let me just break this down for you in my life, um, and just think about it in your own. Take a minute, you know, think about yesterday. What time did you eat dinner? And then 
this morning, what time did you first eat food, breakfast or whatever? So for me, I try to stop eating around 8 p.m. Then in the morning, I wake up and I don't eat, don't eat anything. I actually typically drink a big, tall glass, you know, 20 ounces or so of water. I often, you know, throw in my collagen supplement, a couple other things that they're not food, but they're supplements that I start my day with. And I drink a big glass of water and I don't eat any food for a couple of hours. And I usually will get up and I'll go exercise having eaten nothing. And we'll talk about this a little bit later, how this plays in, but this will help you burn that fat because you're Otherwise, if you eat a big breakfast and then go exercise, you're just maybe burning off the calories you ate, and you're never going to you know, dig into those fat stores. So, so I get up, I don't eat anything, do my exercise, then typically around 10 or 11 a.m., I eat breakfast. I may or may not eat lunch, and then I, I eat dinner, and I try to be done eating by 8 p.m. So from 8 p.m. to 10 a.m., you know, just think of 12 hours plus 2, you don't eat. And during that time, you can drink water if you like to have a little sip of coffee or a glass or, you know, a cup of coffee in the morning. That's fine as long as you're not adding creamers and sugars or please, please, please don't add artificial sweeteners. We talked about that and how it wrecks your gut and increases insulin uh, secretion and all that. Please avoid those. But having a little bit of coffee or tea or especially water, drink as much water as you need, you know, um, Typical recommendation is, you know, your body weight in ounces per day, but you can do that all throughout your fast, but try to not eat food for 14 hours. And then your, you know, feeding window, if you will, is 10 hours. And so for me, it's about 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. And that's honestly, that's most of the day. So it's not like I'm really restricting myself that much. I just don't eat breakfast when I first wake up. I find that this is a pretty easy approach It's not super difficult, not super challenging. The extremists out there will say, oh, you need at least, you know, 16 hours of fasting minimum, which means you only have an eight hour window to eat. And then you got to add on these 24 hour fasts in addition to that, which is, you know, skipping two meals or a 36 hour fast and do that two to three times a week. I just think, honestly, for most of us, that's kind of excessive unless you have a specific plan that you're working with a physician uh, dietitian, and you've got this all, you know, pretty much structured and you're followed by your health practitioner, not me, but yours. And, um, you know, this is being followed carefully. Then I think you can, you know, if you were aiming for a certain weight loss goal or whatever, and you want to do a more extreme intermittent fast, fine, but do it under the supervision of a professional and have them monitor you during this time, because it's a little bit extreme. And, and I, I'm up for, like I said, in the beginning, more of a Uh, moderate approach. And I think something that's easily obtainable on a daily basis that you can do long-term, I think will have the biggest lasting effects. And let me just give you an example. So, so one of the um, big studies that was done with this was with a group, um, um, Sachin Panda, he's an Indian uh, uh, um, researcher, and he's, he's looked a lot into this. If if you um, are even slightest you know, have the slightest interest, I'd recommend reading some of his stuff. It's super fascinating. But just to give you an idea, um, this is well studied, well shown, well proven, not only in laboratory, you know, mice, animals, but also in humans. And basically their initial studies looked at um, a 10 hour feeding window in these mice. And what, what I think is super fascinating is that the group that got the 10 hour window, they got the exact same food as the group that let, you know, they were allowed to eat basically like most of us whenever we want, (laughs) you know, the Burger King style approach, have it your way, have it whenever you want, you know, blah, blah, blah. So they actually fed them the same amount of calories, these two groups of mice, and these were identical mice. Okay. Same genetic material. So it's not the genes and some of them weren't predisposed to being fat and others not exact same mice. Basically one group was allowed to feed only in a 10 hour window. So 14 hours, they were fasting just like my recommended approach and the thing that I try to follow. Then the other group ate the same exact food, but they could eat it early. They could eat it late. They could have a midnight snack. Basically it was up to them when they wanted to eat it. So what I find so interesting is that the group that was allowed to eat the same calories, same diet. They even tried to give them quote unquote healthy foods. But if they allowed that window to basically be up to the individual um, mouse, for example, that mouse got fat. 
that mouse gained significant 30% more weight than the mouse that was restricted to eating the same calories, same diet during the 10-hour window. So same calories in, calories out. But guess what? It didn't equal to the weight. And, and so this is the fundamental flaw of, of a lot of the teaching out there that, by physicians like myself who were not trained appropriately in this in medical school, a lot of the dietitians out of there, they go back to this, you know, calories in, calories out thing, which, you know, I hate to say it, not right, not, not exactly, does not explain the whole picture. And it's outdated. It's frankly, frankly outdated. And so the group of mice that had the narrowed feeding window actually were 30% lighter um, in weight. And also much, the thing that I like even more, is that they were so much more healthy. They avoided chronic disease states like insulin resistance, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, cancers. All these chronic health conditions had decreased significantly in the group that did the restrictive eating or only a 10-hour feeding window, um, which is what I described earlier, whereas the group that was allowed to eat the same calories not only got fat, you know, and due to the fact that they could, their window was as long as they wanted, early in the morning, late at night, midnight snack, whatever, even though they had the same calories, they not only got fat, but they also had an increased incidence of a lot of chronic diseases. And so this is what I find super fascinating because it's not explained by the calories in, the calories out phenomenon, not in the least, right? This is not explained by that. And so what I find to be super interesting here is that we can easily, easily adjust this to our schedule. Even the people like myself who tend to be shift workers, you know, I often have to be up in the middle of the night, you know? And so even though, as I mentioned earlier, the two major cues we have are light and food, the light portion I can't really control, right? If I'm in the hospital in the middle of the night, the lights are on, it's bright. And so that's disrupting my circadian rhythm. But if I'm sticking to my 10-hour window, I can basically avoid a lot of these increased risks of chronic diseases as well as, you know, be able to maintain my weight better and be healthier if I just restrict my eating to that 10-hour block of time. And, and this is fascinating. This is an ongoing area of research. They actually are currently, and, and have done some, but are, are currently doing more studies on shift workers, specifically folks like me that work on the front lines, the firemen who do 24-hour uh, shifts in general. They're looking at you know, how they can help them to be more healthy, and they're finding that you know, because they can't really control the light cue, right? Because if they got to get up in the middle of the night and respond to an emergency or what have you, you know, that part they can't really adjust, but they can, you know, control for when they, they eat, you know, how many hours a day and what their window is and, and so on. And this is super fascinating stuff because the timing of our food has significantly been shown to affect not only our weight, but also our health in general. And this as I mentioned, it has been super popular on recent, you know, um, health programs like Dr. Oz had a, had a physician, I think his name was Dr. Mosley, who wrote that book called The Fast uh, Diet, which talks about intermittent fasting. And, and I, you know, I think it's so interesting because it's not what we're typically taught, right? It's not, uh, you know, we used to be taught you know, the breakfast is the most important meal a day. Well, I'll tell you, that's crap. <laughs> that is crap. That's old thinking. It's not correct. I mean, for me, I, I, if I eat breakfast at all, like I mentioned earlier, I eat it at like 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. And so, you know, besides narrowing this window, which is super, super important, and I would recommend, you know, forget these extreme, you know, fasting periods, 24, 36 or more hours, you know, for now, let's just avoid that and let's just stick to a real simple regimen of a 10-hour feeding window where you have 14 hours, you know, most of that, eight of it at least, will be sleeping a couple hours in the evening in addition, a couple hours in the morning in addition where you're not eating, where you can, of course, drink water, have your coffee or tea or whatever. But while we're eating, let's still try to pay attention to what we're eating too. Although, you know, in the rats, they basically gave them the same calories and it was mattered more really, you know, the timing of their intake rather than what they were eating. 
because they're fed the same things. But I still think it's important to monitor what we're eating as well. But uh, what has come to light here is that the timing may possibly even be more important. And this is fascinating, fascinating stuff. But at the same time, let's not throw everything out the window, all the other teaching we've talked about previously about trying to eat natural, clean, whole, real foods, right? That's super important, you know, try to avoid all the processed garbage out there, the refined sugars, the breads, pastas, sweets, the carbs, you know, all that stuff, even juices, like nobody needs juice. I mean, I'm subject to this, you know, in my first two kids, I'll admit, we used to buy like apple juice for these guys. We were told by our pediatrician that that's what we should be giving them in, in less milk and, and more apple juice. And, and to be honest, neither one of those things was really awesome for them, you know. <laughs> but, but basically, we don't want to throw our other eating habits out the window. We still want to eat good, wholesome, clean foods, you know, but only eat them during this window, you know. And I'm all about being an omnivore. And, and I'm open, you know, with that. I'm not saying I'm a strict this or that. I'm not a strict carnivore, vegan, what have you. I'm an omnivore. I eat a little bit of everything. All things in moderation is kind of my jam. You know, fats are okay if you're getting the good natural fats, you know, like the avocados, if you're going to use oils, coconut oil, you know, real butter, you know, of course, lots of plant-based stuff, which is what I eat primarily. But having, you know, having some animal-based foods, like I eat eggs, for example, I eat a steak every now and then, you know, that's fine too. But I think if we can focus on this window, this will really help us because what we found is that, you know, one of the reasons this is so helpful is because our bodies, they need this time, this so-called fasting time. Like I mentioned, we're shooting for 14 hours of a fast. We need that time for rejuvenation. It's a restorative time. You know, we're not only sleeping in part of this time, you know, eight hours of it or so, but we need to allow our bodies to be in that regenerative, you know, restful phase, which, you know, involves lowering, you know, the insulin levels, our cholesterol levels get improved during this time. You know, we have our DNA being repaired, you know, by our telomerase in our body is repairing those telomeres. And, and basically this restorative time is so important. And if we are eating too late into the evening, this restorative time, protective time that's helping us to, you know, prevent a lot of these chronic illnesses and diseases is getting cut short. You know, a lot of people use this kind of like three hour window you know, three hours before bed, we shouldn't be eating anything. And I'm in agreement with that. I think, I think that's a great plan. But more importantly is that we have this full window. You know, I'm, I'm asking, you know, us to do a 14-hour window of fasting. Um, and this can start, you know, three hours before we go to bed. And then it can basically, you know, go beyond our waking by another three hours. So that's a pretty easy buffer, right? Three hours in the morning hours in the evening, and then we can eat the whole rest of the time. And that basically puts us at a 10 hour feeding window. So it's not, I think, I think it's attainable. It's not super, super difficult, but it's so important because during this 14 hour fast, if you will, not only is it restorative to our body, you know, like I just mentioned, we're repairing our, our oxidative stress that happened during the day. Our DNA is repairing itself and all of that. And it's decreasing our risk of cancers and chronic diseases. But also, what's key here, too, especially if we're interested in a little bit of weight loss, I mean, who isn't, right? I mean, we as Americans, two-thirds of us are overweight. Like, guys and gals both. It's just, that's the fact. At least two-thirds of us are overweight. And so, we maybe all want to lose a little bit of fat. But the best way to do that is to allow ourselves this window where 14 hours, we're not feeding ourselves. And then our body can kick into this sort of ketosis phase where we actually burn our fat. We can actually burn it because if we keep eating these previously, you know, professed, you know, small frequent meals throughout the day that, that used to be, you know, taught us by our dietitians, nutritionists, even physicians like me, small frequent meals all throughout the day, blah, blah, blah. If we keep doing that, we never get out of the glucose metabolism. We never actually get into breaking down the fat. But if we give ourselves the 10 hour window of eating, 14 hour window of fasting, then we can actually get into that phase of fat burning both during the evening while we sleep. How awesome is that? You know, we're 
burning fat and we're not even doing anything. We're just sleeping. And then, and then I would challenge you also try this under the supervision, of course, of your doctor or, or a practitioner, but even do your exercise in the morning when you get up without eating anything first. And then you'll preferentially burn that fat. You know, make sure you're well hydrated and all that sort of stuff. But, but this will really, really help to burn that fat. And otherwise, if we don't and our window is too wide and we're eating, you know, 16, 18 hours of the day and then maybe sleeping for the eight, that's just not going to cut it. We're never going to get into that fat burning window. And so at the end of the day, just think about your schedule. And the part I love about this is that we can all modify it to our own schedule. It's not hard. It's not challenging. We basically look at our day. When do we wake up? When do we go to sleep? And I think if we aim to sleep, you know, roughly eight hours, then we just do a three-hour buffer in the evening and a three-hour buffer in the morning when we wake up. And then we got it. We got our 10-hour feeding window, you know, and we got our 14-hour fasting window. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy, as my kids say. Simple. I would challenge you to do this for a month. And hopefully you'll just keep doing it. One of the initial studies they did in humans was that they basically did this. They asked them to do this, and not only did they lose weight, but as time went on, even after a year of having taught them this, I think the initial study was only for a month or two, they looked at these people again, and guess what? Not only had they lost weight, but they kept the weight off. And the reason being is that they continued to restrict their eating for those 10 hours, and then they did the 14-hour fast every day. And when you ask them, and I found this to be fascinating, when you ask them why they continued to do this, it wasn't just because, I mean, part of it, yeah, sure, they lost the weight and they wanted to keep it off, but they felt better. They felt better. Every day, they felt good. They weren't getting the same kinds of aches and pains that they were having. Part of this is due to the inflammatory cascade, right? They were giving their bodies a break, giving them time to be restorative, and so the amount of inflammation in their bodies went down, right? Their insulin sensitivity increased, their insulin resistance you know, decreased, and the inflammation in their body went down, so they felt better. They didn't have as much achy joints and things like that. They also had more energy. They also slept better, and this was just focusing on eating during that 10 hours and then having the 14 for that so-called fasting phase. And so that's, that's what I want sort of us to focus on. Like I said, there's more extremes of that, these 24-hour, 36-hour fasts and all that. Um, they kind of do the same thing but exaggerated, and I really think that those should be under very, very careful control and monitoring by your physician, dietitian, coach, you know, that's really focused on monitoring your blood glucose levels and all these things because they're just more prone to problems. And especially if you have any kind of chronic health condition now, like, you know, diabetes or hypertension, you know, kidney disease, all that, you don't want to go into a 24, 36 hour fast, you know, without very, very careful control and monitoring by your physician. Um, and this that I'm sort of, um, you know, uh, asking us, well, this is what I ask of myself to do, you know, the 10 hour feeding window and 14 hour fasting window, I think is, is more doable. It's easier. It's reproducible. And like as studied, people tend to be able to continue to do this month after month and year after year. And they continue with these benefits of not only keeping the weight off, but the health benefits that I mentioned of decreases in the propensity towards a lot of these chronic illnesses. And so at the end of the day, obviously what we eat affects our health. Of course, we've talked about that a lot in previous podcasts, but the timing, the timing of it may matter even more. And this is due to that, you know, teleologic thing of our ancestry that we're based on a 24 hour clock. And so paying attention to this and not disrupting our circadian rhythm with eating too late into the day or too early into the morning, I have found that this can help us tremendously, you know, to be able to be healthier, to feel better, to have more energy, to be less achy, to be able to burn fat, keep it off. And, you know, it'll also protect us from certain of these chronic diseases. So why not? It's easy, easy, right? Investment. It's free. (laughs) 
<laughs> it doesn't cost anything. So I would challenge us to try it and do it under the, you know, to do it under the supervision of your physician or practitioner. You know, I'm not giving you any medical advice here, but I'm just sharing what I've learned and what I've tried and done. And I found it to be fairly simple practice to do, to have a 10 hour feeding window. And personally, you know, I've even felt better. I enjoy this lifestyle better. And I, although, you know, I eat in moderation and eat all different sources of food, I found that this window affects more of sort of the long term and the day to day than, you know, exactly what I eat. I'm not, you know, a Nazi about keeping track of everything I put into my body. I just think that the the common person out there like me, it's just too much for me to write down every single thing I eat throughout the day. I I think that's great if you want to do that and you may need to, to kind of get started, but I, I just think it's more important to focus on the big picture, try to avoid the bad things, try to eat clean, and then focus on this feeding window, this 10 hour feeding window. So we're not disrupting our circadian rhythm. Okay. So, so try that. Let me know how it works for you. But I've found in both my research and in my own, you know, um, experience in my life, in my family's life, as we've done that, it's helped us to feel better, to be healthier, keep that weight off, to maintain a good level of energy. And, and so that's one of the disruptors of our circadian rhythm that I think we can have a pretty good handle and a pretty good control over is just the time of our feeding. The other big cue, as I mentioned, is light. And I'm going to develop a whole podcast on light talking about the photoreceptors in our eyes and the melatonin and how that gets released and the suprachiasmatic nucleus and that whole interplay. And, and should we supplement with melatonin? Should we do this? Should we do that? How can we affect you know, the light, you know, avoiding the blue light of our computer screens and cell phones too late at night or getting you know, a filter for that or whatever. We'll talk all about that because that's, I think, equally fascinating, but we're going to do it in another show. And for now, I just wanted to thank you once again for listening. I'm so grateful for you all. It's just been a true, true blessing to be able to share with you. And so keep the feedback coming, you know, look into this uh, restrictive eating window. Try to do the 10 hour thing of feeding, 14 hours of fasting. And you'll find it's so easy. The fasting won't continue to have such a negative connotation for it. I think most people think about fasting, they kind of get freaked out. And this is easy. It's doable. It's been shown to be helpful. So let me know how it goes for you. Keep the feedback coming. You know, send me your comments. Modern Medicine Movement Podcast at Gmail. ModernMedicineMovement.com listen to us, give us a review. would love it if you could do a five-star review and just share it with your friends and family, whoever might benefit, because I do this for you. We are all on that journey for optimal and complete health. And so thank you, thank you, thank you. Sending out a big aloha.